today is, is really two things. One is I want to give you a quick orientation to the framework and especially the securities law framework that you will encounter as you launch your various businesses and networks. And then I want to talk about some choices that you'll all confront um, from a legal perspective as you launch your various kinds of projects. Those are slightly different issues, so I'm going to separate those, and we're going to start with just a little bit of background. So um, it's a moment about my own background because um, it, it's a little bit of the kind of um, bifurcated background that you will all need to develop in order to be successful in the space. So I, I have spent the last uh, couple of years as the chief legal officer of Coinbase, but I also have a background in fintech and traditional finance. And uh, I'm not going to say a ton about my own background. Uh, you're welcome to look at what's in front of you on the screen, obviously. But what I will tell you is crypto is the most perfect intersection of tech and finance. Um, crypto projects are fundamentally trying to disintermediate traditional money and traditional finance. But the regulatory regime that you have to deal with as you do that is a financial services regime. And that's the education I want to give you today. So I'm going to try and address four basic things in this talk. The first is I want to orient you to the background that governs crypto generally. And as you'll see, there are a number of different agencies and a number of different legal regimes that you need to be familiar with as you launch your projects. The one I'm gonna focus on is the securities uh, law regime. And I think for many of you who are at least some way down the pike in your projects, you've probably heard that it's a bad thing to be a security. I want to disabuse you of that notion a little bit and to make clear that being a security doesn't mean that you're illegal, but it does mean that you have to comply with a set of disclosure rules and other things that you need to be ready for if you go in that direction. I want to spend a few minutes uh, talking about the Crypto Rating Council, which is a group uh, Coinbase helped to found that has developed a tool that will help you navigate securities law, uh, both in the United States and later elsewhere. And then finally, I want to help you think through some of the trade-offs you will probably encounter as you launch your businesses uh, so that you can think up front about what your priorities are and then optimize for legal compliance in the lightest weight way possible. Let's go to the next. Begin by saying that you, for those of you who are right at the startup phase, as I assume most of you are in this crypto startup school, you're going to make some early choices early on that are going to affect your viability legally down the road. And so I'm going to assume that all of you have three things in mind. And the question is, where are you in your journey and which things do you need to optimize for at which point, right? So all of you are building networks of some kind uh, that you hope to operate. It could be a media network. It could be a, uh, a sort of a ledger network. It could be a financial services uh, operation or something else. But you all want to operate a network with members and nodes on your network. You also, of course, are going to want to raise money. And generally speaking, part of the initial offering of a token is designed to raise money. It may also be designed to do other things. And finally, there will likely be some point in the future where you're going to want to go public. Now, that could mean a traditional IPO. It could mean some kind of a token process that will allow your coin to be your way of accessing public capital markets. But in one way or another, it's highly likely that all of you will want to do all three of these things. And so I'm going to try and get into the details of how to think about each of those, uh, each of those uh, milestones that you'll hit. So I promise you we do a little bit of background on regulation. And this is the background piece you need to know, is that there are multiple regimes that matter when you're launching a crypto project. And there are multiple agencies, both in the United States and abroad, that will become second nature to you, even if you haven't heard about them before. So I'm going to start by orienting you to the idea that uh, the Treasury Department uh, in the United States is a very important stakeholder in a couple of different ways. And they're important even if your project is not based in the United States. Okay, So the Treasury has several offices that have an impact on crypto projects. There's an office called the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, or FinCEN, which polices money laundering laws in the U.S. and also is relevant to terrorist financing laws. FinCEN is the organization that um, looks at, at uh, SAR filings for suspicious activity that might occur on your network. And they also make sure that you're not in the business of using your token to allow criminals to launder money in ways that can't be caught during the normal bank surveillance process. Treasury also enforces uh, a rule that is administered by the OFAC office, the Office of Foreign Assets Control. The Office of Foreign Assets Control is an important sanctions tool that the U.S. government 
uh, ma maintains to make sure that sanctioned individuals, whether they are war criminals or people who live in countries that are sanctioned, uh, are not able to receive money through the financial system. Uh, and then there are other offices at Treasury, like the IRS, uh, who is responsible for tax regulation in the U.S., um, who may become relevant to you depending on exactly how you're distributing your token and how you're accounting for the value of the token at the time that people acquire it. Uh, so these are all important in, in many ways. Now, I said a moment ago that even though the Treasury is a U.S. agency, it will matter to you if you're launching uh, abroad. And that is because the Treasury has the ability to impose sanctions through various of these offices. And so even if you are launching in Asia or in Europe or in some other part of the world, the Treasury has the ability to dictate that your project has to be sanctioned and excluded from any financial system that does business with the United States. So the important takeaway here is that if you have money laundering issues, terrorism financing issues, or other, other regulatory issues related to who your customers or users are, the Treasury has a very long arm and has the ability to affect your operation even in other countries. Now, the second agency that I want to talk about just for a moment, and I'll say a lot more about this later, is the Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC. What I'm sure most of you have heard from your VCs or from any of your advisors as you're launching your products is the single biggest impact that regulation has on crypto projects is securities regulation. And that's because of the SEC's view that certain tokens may constitute securities. I'll talk more about that and what that means in just a few moments, but understand for the moment that the SEC is responsible both for securities enforcement. So if you offer an asset that is deemed to be a security, you have to comply with certain disclosure rules. And then they're also uh, responsible for enforcing exchange rules. So if you're launching a DeFi project that might arguably look like a broker dealer, uh, if you're trying to help people operate a trading platform in various ways, it's conceivable that the SEC would look at your project and determine that what you're doing is operating a broker dealer, which requires special licensing. So I'll come back to the SEC in a lot more detail in a few minutes. There is another agency in the government, another independent agency called the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, or CFTC. And the CFTC regulates some of the more interesting and exotic cutting edge crypto project, uh, projects, projects like margin lending, for example, or crypto futures or crypto swaps. These are things that have gotten more traction in Asia than in the U.S., uh, but people in the U.S., including Coinbase, are looking at different variants of this. And in those cases, the CFTC is your agency, and you need to understand the details of their regulations if you want to offer those kinds of products. Finally, Many people think, well, if I operate outside the U.S., I can avoid this heavy regulation by going somewhere else. And what I would tell you is uh, there are different gradations of regulation depending on the jurisdiction you're planning to launch from. The European Union tends to have a regulatory environment that looks fairly like the United States, not radically different from the United States in its shape. Singapore, on the other hand, recently adopted a law that um, is simpler, lighter weight than the U.S., but does provide some amount of regulatory oversight for crypto. I would argue Singapore is probably a more clear and more certain regime than the EU or the United States, but don't think there's no regulation over there. And then there's Japan, where I know some folks on this, uh, on this call uh, are located. And Japan has, a on the one hand, one of the very biggest crypto markets in the world, but on the other hand, a very, very uh, complicated regulatory regime. So don't think that simply by basing yourselves outside the U.S. that you can avoid crypto regulation. Uh, the jurisdiction in which you're locating and where you plan to serve customers will have its own rules, and it's going to be important to understand those consulting with your own counsel. So what I really want to focus most on in this conversation is securities law. I, I say that because it's the most... Uh, overweight part of any legal analysis you're going to do because it affects both the nature of the token that you're allowed to offer and the manner in which you can distribute that token. So I want to help you understand just in a layperson's language the way that federal securities law in the United States works. So the question is why do we have securities law in this country and how can it affect a token project? The reason we have securities law in this country is because of a belief that if someone is making an investment in you, and when I say you, I mean you as a human being, they're entitled to know who you are, what you're doing, what risk factors you perceive, where your money's coming from, what kind of governance you deploy, right? And so the whole issue to think about when you ask yourself if securities law cares about you or not is the question of whether the value of the token you're going to offer is dependent on whether you as a management team succeed 
or whether it's based on something else, right? So if you have a token that is entirely based on its utility in a functioning network, right? If, if in other words, the value of your token is similar to the value of a baseball ticket in getting you admission to a ballpark, then you may not have a securities issue. But if the value of the token is based on whether you are successful in building something you haven't built yet or marketing an asset to a market that is uncertain, then it's highly likely that the securities regulators are going to want you to provide disclosures to your customers. That's a simple way of thinking about it. If the token of, if the value of your token is contingent upon your success, then it likely is a security and people are going to want to know information like the information on this slide. And if you use your token to raise money, and if you're asking people to pay you for the token, an investment of their own funds, then there's some risk that your token is going to be deemed to be a security subject to all of these laws. Okay, so we're going to get into this in a lot more detail here in a moment. You don't need to know a lot about securities law to launch a successful token project, and you certainly don't need to go to law school to do that, but there's one thing you do need to know, because you'll hear this a lot from your lawyers, and that is something called the Howey test. The Howey test, uh, which many of you have probably already heard of, comes from a Supreme Court case in the 1940s that defined when a given kind of a transaction is a securities transaction versus when it's something else, okay? And all you need to know for today's purposes is that the Howey test imposed a four-part test, right? Each of these parts must be satisfied in order for something to be a security. First, somebody has to invest money in it, right? So if you just give something away for free, it's likely that that transaction is not a security. If someone earns something through work or through taking a course or something, it may not be a security, right? But if they give you money in exchange for a token, that's one factor that weighs in favor of being deemed a security. The second factor is whether there's a common enterprise going on. So in other words, when they pay you money, are you all co-owners of a company who's going to rise or fall in value based on various factors, right? So if you're all now co-venturers and co-owners of a single enterprise, that tends to suggest that there is a security transaction going on. The third factor is pretty easy. Do people who are giving you their money expect to make a profit on that money? If they don't, then that's a helpful fact. But if they tend to expect a profit, as most people do, that suggests, again, that it may be a security. And finally, and this is the point I made a moment ago, finally, it's a factor in favor of it being a security if the transaction is going to generate a profit based on your work, right? So if I give you $100 and I'm asking you to work really hard to grow my $100 into $200, that tends to suggest that it's a security because I'm entitled to know who you are, what you're doing, and what your business plan is. So those are the factors that the SEC and any court in the United States will use to determine whether you're covered by the securities laws. The problem in the U.S., and one of the reasons it's worth having something like Crypto Startup School, is that how those four factors apply to any given project is unknown. And the SEC is not in the business of providing very much clarity, right? So that's what I want to help you with here in the next couple of slides. Before I tell you the tools that Coinbase and our partners in the Crypto Rating Council have built to help you navigate these shoals, let me tell you that there may be some good news on the horizon, right? So if you're a technologist and you're thinking, geez, Brian, um, I've got a great idea for bringing decentralized you know, finance to the world, but I have no idea how to comply with these securities laws, then the good news is that one of the SEC commissioners recently came out with a proposal to give you clarity. Now, I want to emphasize this isn't law yet, and you can't rely on this yet, but it's on the horizon and may provide you some help in the future. And so this particular SEC commissioner, a commissioner named Hester Peirce, recently put forward a proposal that would scrap everything I just said and make it much simpler. What her proposal would do is it would say that if you're launching a token project, you have three years to achieve utility on your network or to achieve decentralization in your network. And if you can do one of those things inside of three years, then it doesn't matter what happened at the beginning of your token project, you're not a security and you have a safe harbor to proceed doing what you're doing. On the other hand, if at the end of three years you haven't achieved all those things, then there's a safe path to securities registration and no one will come after you uh, for violating the law. That seems to Coinbase and a lot of other big companies in this space a very sensible proposal because it provides a path to legality and it gives you a period of time to build your project while still raising money. But I emphasize that's not the law yet. And so what we need to focus on today is how to get your projects launched now 
But a year from now, you may see the safe harbor pro proposal take effect, in which case things will be a lot simpler. So let me talk to you about the way the law is today, right? Today, it's not as simple as in the purse proposal. Today, we have the Howey test. You may be subject to uh, securities regulation. And so with that in mind, um, a group of companies, including the 11 companies that you see on this list, led by Coinbase, put together something called the Crypto Rating Council. And the idea was to develop what we think of as the securities equivalent of the Motion Picture Association movie rating scale. So most of, you are, most of you are familiar with the idea that when you go out to see a movie in uh, this country and many others, we will tell you based on the rating of the movie, how much violence you might see, how much nudity you might see, how much offensive language you might see. And everyone's come to understand how an R rated movie is different from a PG rated movie. We all know what that's like. So the concept of the Crypto Rating Council was to bring that approach to crypto tokens, to let you know that, hey, here's a token that is a little bit risky. And here's another token that's a little bit less risky. You know, this is an R-rated token. This is a PG-13 token. This might be a G-rated token. And so the purpose is to bring that same level of clarity to crypto so that you all have a sense of where you are on the risk spectrum. The key is to understand that like with the movie rating scale, these securities risk ratings have to be objective. They can't be based on somebody's opinion. And so we built an objective, numerically based rating scale that can be applied to any token to tell you where you are uh, in terms of your risk of an SEC investigation. So the Crypto Rating Council um, got together and we put together a 36 question uh, framework. Here you can just see the first three questions, but you see how it works. So the framework asks a series of yes, no questions. And we weighted each of those questions so that the most important ones have more points associated with them and the less important ones have fewer points associated with them. But all of these questions roll up to a bottom line score and they tell you on a one to five scale where you fall. In the view of the Crypto Rating Council members who represent most of the market in the United States, a five rating on the CRC scorecard is very likely a security. And most of the exchanges who are in the Crypto Rating Council will not list a five unless they have a broker dealer license. So if you're scoring a five or something very close to a five, it's likely that that's going to be difficult to list in the United States. On the other hand, if you're getting something that's a one, a two, a three, or even really anything less than a four, most of the Crypto Rating Council members will see that as sufficiently different from a security, even though it may have indicia of a security, that it is safe to list. Okay, and so again, without belaboring the point, you'll see some of the questions here on the left side of your screen, along with the weightings that, uh, that we give to a yes answer or a no answer on various of the Howey factors. Now, you might ask yourself, how do these scores all roll up uh, to one of these one, two, three, four, five scaled scores? And if we go to the next slide, I'll show you how that works. So the concept is, if on the four Howey factors, if three of those factors have a, have a scorecard score below 100, we regard that as perfectly safe. It looks nothing like a security. We have no issues. To give you an example of a one, Bitcoin is a one. Uh, and we know that it's a one because the SEC has told us that it is definitively not a security. And when we ran Bitcoin through our scorecard, we came up with that result. It really doesn't have any indicia of a security. It is uh, entirely decentralized. There is no central management team. Um, it is a fully functioning network. It really doesn't look anything like it's a speculative investment. Uh, to give you an example of a two, Ethereum scores a two on the Crypto Rating Council scorecard. Ethereum did originally have a central management team, right? There was a group of people who invented this thing and it achieved decentralization only a little bit later. Uh, and so it's slightly different from Bitcoin, but still so far away from a security that we see very little risk that Ethereum would be deemed a security. But you can see what happens as you go up the scaled score, you can get closer and closer to a five. And again, I would just tell you that um, as you go north of four, most U.S. exchanges will be very, very careful uh, about listing your token. And so it's important that you know where you are on this scaling system uh, before you go too far down your building path, right? You want to know as you're building the token that when you're done building it, someone will list it. So in terms of this one to five point scale, there, there are really two things to be thinking about, which is, which, which is super important. So one is the token itself, right? Does the token itself have the hallmarks of a security on the scaling system that I just described? And then there's the question of, regardless of whether the token is a security, are you distributing it in a manner that triggers securities concerns? 
or have you distributed in a way that avoids those concerns, even if the token itself might be a security? So what we try and talk about here, uh, and we'll say more about this in a moment, is even if your token is a security, let, let's say that it's totally an investment of money, let's say that your network is not yet functional, let's say that most people are buying it with the expectation of profit, uh, and let's say that it's all dependent on the success of a central management team, it's still legally possible for you to issue that token without violating the securities laws, as long as there's an exemption that you can follow within, or as long as there's some other strategy that isn't directly a securities listing. And we're going to talk about some options for you on that. But the point is, before you can figure this out, you need to think about where am I on this Crypto Rating Council scorecard, right? And I'll talk to you in a few minutes about how Coinbase and others can help you think that through. So, in terms of where your risk factors are, and when you're thinking about this from a startup perspective, what I want to suggest to you today is that there are multiple things you might be trying to do in your project. And if you manage it correctly, you might be able to do any of these things as long as you're careful, right? And I'm going to get into each one of these in detail in just a moment. But let me first say, as an overview, that the main things you might be wanting to do in your project is you might be wanting to... Um, sell a service that's currently available. So let's say that you are a fully functional network and the issue is getting members on your network. You might be trying to do that, right? That's kind of like selling baseball tickets. I've got the team, I've got the stadium, I just need people in the seats. A second thing you might be trying to do is to raise money. Let's say that you already have a fully operational project, but you need to iterate it to the next level or you need to refine it or grow it or market it and that takes money. Well, if you have a fully functioning network, there's a way to raise funds that is relatively uncontroversial as long as you're careful. And again, I'll talk to you about the details in a moment. And that's a little bit different from if you're trying to raise money for a network that's not quite functional. So here in Crypto Startup School, my guess is that many of you have great ideas and you've written compelling white papers, but the network is not yet live, right? You're still in testnet mode or maybe you haven't even built the network. Well, that's a little bit riskier, and you got to be a little bit more careful if you're going to raise money for a network that's not yet operational, right? And then there's another methodology where, uh, and this is the seed users bit, where, hey, the, the, the issue is I'm on the very front end. The network may or may not be fully functional, but I really, really need people on the network for it to work. Here, you might be more risky even than the, the, than the last example but there may be techniques you can use to mitigate that risk and still get launched in a way that US exchanges will list. So I'm gonna start with the first of these concepts, the idea of a fully functional network where what you're trying to do is sell that service, right? So the great thing is if your network is already fully live, if that's the issue, and fundamentally what you're trying to do is get people using the system. In other words, take my baseball stadium analogy, highly unlikely you're gonna be deemed to be a security at that point. Our, our general read subject to you know, the specifics of your project is, that's gonna score a one like Bitcoin. It's ready to go, anyone can sign up, but the ledger is functioning and you're, and you're off to the races. Fully functional network on day one where you're not trying to raise risk capital, you're instead just trying to charge money and generate revenue as an operating company, that's not likely to be deemed a security. My guess is that in a startup program like this, most of you aren't there yet, but if you were, we think you probably don't have very many securities law issues to worry about. So here's a slightly different concept. Let's say that you have the project, but it's not the ultimate project. You need to add a lot of more, a lot of new features, right? Or you need to refine it to make the user interface better or something like that. In that kind of a world, the fundraising aspect and the idea that you are going to change the network is going to be seen somewhat negatively by courts and by securities regulators. But still, the fact that the network is fully available and the fact that the purpose of this is to fund the next iteration of networks, which will benefit all of your current users, is going to look less like a fundraise, less like a securities offering, and it's going to look more like a capital raise at your golf club or something like that. It's going to seem more like it's, it's just sort of iterating, not, not offering risk assets. And while that will be harder to justify than the previous example, it's still going to be in the realm of an ETH score. We're still going to be pretty comfortable with that. Here's where things change. My guess is that most of you on this call are in this bucket, okay? You all have a great idea. You've written your white paper. You've perhaps built some software, but your success as a dev team is critical. And if you fail, the value of your token is going to be zero. And if you succeed, it's going to be high, right? 
And so what token holders are doing is they're buying on the come access to a network that doesn't yet exist. And in a case like this, you're going to be a little bit riskier, right? And if you do it wrong, you're going to trigger some of these factors in our scorecard that will mean Coinbase and others will likely not list you. So the trick here is to be very, very careful about how you market this token, right? It's to make very clear that the reason you're selling the token is because you're going to build something valuable that people will want access to in the future. And you're not selling the token for investment purposes. You're selling the token because people can get an early mover discount um, for this thing that's going to happen uh, later. So imagine if you're getting the early tickets to the next Star Wars movie before they've gone retail. The movie might or might not be good, but the odds are that the tickets are going to cost 20 bucks. And for 10 bucks today, you can buy an early ticket, right? It's an early mover discount. That works. Some of these things also have other features. And as long as there's no requirement that people opt into those features, in, instead they're simply buying access to the network, that will also help mitigate your score. All I'm really trying to land though with you is the idea that if you're in this bucket, you're gonna to have to be a little bit more careful and we can help you think that through. That's what I'm gonna to get to at the end of this presentation is the way in which Coinbase and other companies can help you think this through before you issue the token. Let's look at one last slide here. So here, this is the thing that we think is probably, uh, probably the most risky. So if your project depends on you scaling up rapidly and having a large number of users, and, uh, and what you're trying to do is build a large network of people who are token holders, the things you have to watch out for here are that you're not charging people for this uh, right, right? That you're not charging them for the privilege of being in your network. These are, you know, this is a scenario where you can reduce your risk by giving away the asset for free or distributing the asset through an education program like an EARN program at Coinbase or similar programs that other exchanges offer. The reason this is risky is because the value to these seed users is still dependent on the dev team. And you may not yet have a functioning network yet. And you may market it in a way that convinces people that the reason they should sign up early for your project is because they might make money on the token value, not that they might achieve utility on the network. All of those are risk factors, and we can help you build mitigants into it on the front end if you if you identify these issues, excuse me, in advance. There's one, let me just say, the last four scenarios are widely understood scenarios in the, in the crypto world. Um, lots of developers have confronted each of those scenarios, and we kind of have a track record of understanding how that works and how the securities regulators think about it. There is a big new idea out there that people are talking about, however. And this has not yet been tested, but at Coinbase, we think that it has great promise. This is a model that we think may allow you to sell the token and specifically sell it for the purpose of raising funds to build your network, right? And to not violate the securities laws in doing so. There's just one catch, which is in this model, you can totally sell to a group of future users. They can speculate on it. They can buy it because they think they're going to make money. But the trick is, that they agree when they buy the token that they will only sell the token to other members of the network. They will not sell it to the public in a secondary offering. This is what we call the membership model or the mutual model. And as I'm going to describe in a second, I think this is going to sound very similar to other economic uh, sectors that you're probably familiar with. So the concept here is that you want to raise capital. So this is not about selling tickets to your baseball stadium. It really is about raising money to build your network. And the token holders in buying this want to make money, right? So they're here definitely for the economic upside, not just for the utility. Normally, you would think that that would lead to the conclusion that you're offering a security as opposed to a utility token. But what I want to land with you on this membership or mutual concept is the idea that as long as the economic benefit to the token holders is not in a secondary sales market, but is instead because the network you've built is going to be profitable in itself. Okay. that people are going to receive dividends from the operation of the network, but they're not going to receive equity gains by selling to third parties, you may be safe under the securities laws. And if we go to the next slide, I'll give you some examples of how this has worked in other industries. So let's look at the next slide. So for me, who comes out of the financial services world, the most obvious example of a membership model that isn't violating the securities laws would be mutual insurance companies. So I think of my own personal insurance company, Northwestern Mutual. Northwestern Mutual is offering me two things, three things really, uh, that would be consistent with an equity investment, but that isn't in fact covered by securities regulation. So the first thing they're offering me is utility, right? 
I buy an insurance policy and they give me the utility of promising to pay me a death benefit if I die during the policy term. That's a good thing. Another thing they're giving me is the right to vote for the directors of the company. That's a right that usually incurs to equity holders in a public company and it incurs uh, to people who own insurance policies in a mutual insurance company. And then there's a third thing they're offering me, which also sounds very much like a traditional security. They're offering me dividends. So if the company is successful in a given year, the company will achieve a rate of return and they will dividend it back to their owners, namely the policyholders. But the thing that prevents them from being deemed a security by the securities regulators is that the only person I can sell my insurance policy back to if I wanted to is the company, right? It has to stay inside of this closed circle. So, so again, let's be clear. I've given the company a bunch of money in exchange for which they've given me utility, they've given me a right to vote, and they've given me economic upside in the form of dividends. All of that sounds really good. And the only limit I had to agree to in order to avoid securities regulation is that I won't sell my policy in the secondary market. Instead, I'm limiting my ability to sell it back to people who are in the network, namely in this case, the issuer of the insurance policy. Now, I've given you some other examples of companies like this uh, on this slide as well. One that you may be familiar with is REI, the outdoors store. Um, for 20 bucks, you can buy what looks like an ownership stake at REO, and that entitles you to a dividend every year. It entitles you to vote for the board. It entitles you to all kinds of other cool things, but you can't sell your membership other than back to REI, right? So I think at this point, you sort of see the analogy here. A crypto project that had a functioning network could raise money through a token offering. It could offer people dividends from the economic value of the network. It could even let those people have votes for officers and directors and other things inside the network as long as you're willing to limit the secondary trading. This is a big new idea that we've been pioneering over the last couple of months <clears throat> and that people in the industry have talked about. But I emphasize it's a new idea, hasn't been tested with the SEC in our industry, but it has a long enough track record elsewhere that we feel very comfortable exploring it and we'd love to consult with folks who are interested about it. So having given you all of that, there are a handful of over the top issues I wanna make sure that you're warned about and aware of here. Totally separate from the general regulatory regime that I've just talked about. The first is there's a view on the part of many regulators, not just in the US, but also abroad, that gambling tokens, so-called, um, are generally illegal, they're generally against public policy and should be uh, viewed very skeptically. The reason I mention this is because <clears throat> a lot of things that the regulators think of as gambling tokens, we in the crypto world think of very differently. So, you know, we might think that the Augur token is for prediction markets and the uh, regulators might think that prediction markets are no different from gambling, right? Because saying who we think is gonna be president of the United States in 2020 is not that different from saying who's gonna win a horse race or, or something. And so regulators have a specific view of gambling tokens and you need to just know that so that when you're building your project, if that's an issue for you, you know to get out in front of that with your regulators before you launch. There's a lot of controversy around privacy tokens, right? I think everybody on this call knows that, uh, you know, it's a misconception in the world that all crypto tokens are anonymous and private. Uh, we all know that there are lots of tools like Coinbase Analytics and uh, Elliptic and others who are very easily able to do forensic research on most blockchains. But there are some tokens, you know, the Dashes of the Moneros, the Zcashes of the world that have privacy opt-in features and you need to know that law enforcement in some countries is quite skeptical of that. They believe that the ability to surveil transactions uh, is more important to prevent money laundering and terrorism than the countervailing right to have financial privacy. That's not Coinbase's view, but there are law enforcement uh, uh, officials around the world who do have that view. There's an issue of, uh, we call them FATF regulations. FATF is a global treaty organization which stands for the Financial Action Task Force. And the FATF uh, believes that certain aspects of international transactions in crypto, not, not in-country transactions, but international transactions, need to embed sender and recipient information in every transaction so that they can trace transactions back to their originating source. This is controversial, but FATF does have these rules. And so if you're involved in a remittance project or any other international sort of cross-border project, you need to be aware of FATF regulations, including something called the travel rule. And finally, there's a complicated issue in crypto of tax reporting. 
This mostly has to do with people who acquire crypto without a cost basis or people who are engaged in very small dollar transactions. The cost basis issue is if you're doing an airdrop or if you're running an earn campaign and the way that people acquired your token was without spending money, then it's very difficult to calculate a capital gain on that and the tax authorities may well come after you and ask questions. Again, these are just issue spotting for you and all of you will have your legal counsel and your advisors as you launch. But remember that regardless of your securities compliance, any of these four things could inadvertently trip you up and you want to give careful thought um, in advance of launching to make sure that you've put in place mitigants for those kinds of things. So I said earlier uh, uh, several times that there are people who can help with this, right? And, and obviously it's important to consult legal counsel when you're launching these programs, uh, particularly securities legal counsel if you're operating in the United States or in the EU. But what I wanted to suggest on this call is that there are uh, exchanges in this space and Coinbase uh, itself has a program called Coinbase Launch where we are quite eager to advise. <clears throat> you know, it's in our interest <clears throat> that projects that trade on our platform are doing so with a minimum of legal risk. Uh, we want to make sure that we maintain our reputation as the most compliant place to trade crypto in the world, uh, that we can help you think this stuff through so you don't commit footfalls or otherwise inadvertently violate the law. And so I invite you to reach out to the Coinbase Launch team who can look at your project under the Crypto Rating Council scorecard and otherwise help you identify issues early enough that you can still launch your projects with a minimum of muss and fuss. And with that, I'd be completely thrilled to take your questions. I really appreciate everybody participating in this program today. It's super important, and we hope we can add value to what you're building. Thanks, Brian. That was great. The first question is from Ryan, and he's wondering, how do burn models affect the classification of a token as a security? And maybe I'll editorialize a bit and add to that. So burn model um, is when you, when you have a token that you destroy in order to claim, um, you know, some value from the network, and and so, in some senses, it's like a, a stock buyback when a company buys stock um, from the market and and then takes it out of circulation. That in theory should increase the value for for all the other stockholders. A, a burn model is is similar. So he's asking, how does a burn model affect the classification of a token as a security? Right. So so Ryan, I really appreciate the question. What, what I would tell you is. The, the mere fact of making money through some activity doesn't make something a security. So I come back to <clears throat> the, the core of securities law is if I'm taking a risk on you, right, by giving you 20 bucks, hoping that you will succeed in some effort that you're doing, but taking a risk that you won't succeed, then I'm entitled to disclosures about who you are, where you got your money, who your partners are, what your risk factors are, et cetera, right? But the mere fact that I might make money because there's some operation going on does not itself turn something into a securities transaction. So, you know, there are a lot of examples like this, and I'll talk about the burn model in just a second. But take staking as an example. Staking is a thing you can do to make money, right? It's automated. It's it's uh, all you have to do is, is click a box or press a button and suddenly your tokens are being staked and then you're getting more tokens. Nobody thinks that by itself turns um, an otherwise non-securities asset into a security asset simply because you're making money. So on the burn front, the fact that you have something which is either inflationary or counterinflationary, right? Like reducing the number of tokens in the world and thus raising the relative value of the other tokens, as long as it's automated, as long as there's no risk factor in that, it's unlikely to be deemed to be a security just for that reason. Now there may be other factors, but that mere fact of burning the token is not likely to do that. One piece of evidence for that is that many stablecoin projects, including Coinbase's USDC stablecoin, have a burn feature, right? When you redeem that token, we burn that token to ensure that it's never reused and never double paid. And yet there's nothing else about the project that would suggest that it would be security, and the regulators we've talked to have kind of confirmed that view. So I would say that a burn feature, although it might tend to raise the value of other tokens, shouldn't itself, barring other factors, trigger securities laws. Great. Yeah, yeah, that that's a really great explanation. I think there's a, there's a number of projects in the space today that sort of have this model implemented, and and so it, hopefully that's relieving for them to hear. Um, okay, so next question is from Stefan, and it is, what are the regulatory challenges of operating a fiat to crypto payment rail? Well, uh, that, that's a great question. Um, so this this of course depends on the country. But generally speaking, in the United States, that kind of a transaction is regarded as money transmission, okay? And so you have both a state and a federal um, uh, implication to being a money transmitter. 
first of all, in most states, although weirdly not all, but in the majority of states, if, if you are either converting crypto into fiat or if you are selling crypto in exchange for fiat, that's regarded as money transmission because those states regard crypto as sort of like a stored value instrument or a prepaid card or, or you know, some other instrument that has some latent value represented by the cash price. And so in those states, you have to obtain a money transmission license. Getting the license, interestingly, isn't all that hard, right? But operating the license does subject you to examination and supervision by various state regulators, so you have to know that. Coinbase does have money transmission licenses in the vast majority of states for that reason. Um, in addition to the state level of having to have this MTL license, you also have to register with FinCEN, remember that's that Treasury Bureau that I talked about, as a money services business because there's an overlap in the definition of money transmitters and money services businesses. And the point of all of that is, is that there's a federal concern that if you're allowing people to turn dollars, which go through the banking system, into some other kind of asset that doesn't go through the banking system, there's a possibility that in doing that you're laundering money. Right. So, so like, hey, I've got a bunch of money that I extorted from somebody, but if I turn it into Bitcoin, uh, which had a provenance that was different from the original money laundering, I can then sell the Bitcoin back into dollars and that will launder the money in that way. So as a result of that, you have to register with the Treasury Department as a money services business. Fairly straightforward. Right. And, and what, I guess just for the folks in the program here who are starting out, that's a, not a light thing to do. Right. It, 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 it's a heavy lift. And so, you know. I, I would maybe add that as a startup, you might want to lean on some someone else who's got that figured out because that's just one piece of the puzzle um, while startups have to figure out, you know, how to build a product that people use. Um, meanwhile, you know, Jesse, it's a totally great point. I mean, what I would what I would advise people is uh, many people who are doing a startup are um, lulled into a false sense of security by how easy it is to get a license from one of these states. Um, you know, you have to give your fingerprints, sign up, wait six months, and you have the license. The hard part is operating the license. So when you get your first notice from New York that they're bringing a team of examiners on site to your office to come and turn over your books and records and interview all of your key people and look at your policies and procedures, that's when you may ask yourself whether you did the right thing. So a lot of people comply with this through partnerships, right? Um, it's, it's why it's hard to build an exchange and a lot easier to build a single token project. Right, great. Okay, so next one is from Paul. And he asked, for not for non-transferable membership token, can you transfer it to a non-custodial address that you control? So, for, so for example, you know, you have a paper wallet or hardware wallet. Can you transfer your uh, your membership token to that address? And if so, what's to prevent you from transferring it to a smart contract rather than an end user account, and then selling control of the contract? So, so, so it's a great question, um, and, and I'm super glad that people are thinking about this membership model uh, uh, this way. Uh, as I say, I think there's a ton of promise in it. The, the trick is, um, in order to uh, sort of fall within this general exemption to the securities laws, the trick is to define a robust enough edge of who's in the community that anybody who came in to look at it knows that, hey, I, I know who's in and who's out and that you're only able to transfer this to people who are in. So that has to be a meaningful limit. But at the same time, you know, if you wanna make this as useful as possible to your projects, you wanna define that as broadly as you can, right? So there has to be a knowable limit, but it doesn't have to be a narrow limit, right? Like Northwestern Mutual has millions of policyholders. And I could transfer my policy to anybody within the Northwestern Mutual world or REI can transfer it to anybody within that world. That's fine. It doesn't have to be small, but it has to be defined. And that's really the key. So if there's a way of writing the smart contract such that only nodes on the network or users or families of users or, or some other defined universe is in it, um, then you're okay. You know, an example of this, this is sort of a funny example, but it may, may resonate with some folks on the call is... You know, in the U.S., we have financial institutions called credit unions, and they have a similar rule, which is that you can only be an equity owner of a credit union if you're within a defined, narrow, you know, supposedly narrow uh, universe. But some of these credit unions define themselves as all people who live in Los Angeles County or all people who've ever served in the Navy or, or things like that. So they're very large groups of people, but they do have to be finite. Right. And so, so key element there is you got to know who, who the people are, right? There's some record of, of who these people are and they're on a white list. Or at least a definition that would allow somebody later to engineer who they are, right? right. Some sort of limiting principle. Right. So, so a related question here um, is from Stefan. And if membership 
tokens can't be traded on secondary markets, does that mean that they can't be listed on Coinbase? That is a great question. What, what, so what I would say is, um, you know, Coinbase builds all kinds of different markets, right? And we have all kinds of different matching engines. And so what I would tell you is this is a new enough idea that we haven't yet listed a project like this. But conceptually, there's no reason that we couldn't build an order book that was limited to people who were within a defined universe. That's just end work. Um, but as I say, this is a relatively new idea, which we're really, really excited about. Right. And um, as am I, I'm very excited about this idea. This is, you know, makes very concrete an intuition that I had a long while back when, when thinking about crypto networks and thinking about cooperatives and mutuals and the similar, similarities between them. And it's, it's great that you've got, you know, the legal firepower to, to back it up with some precedent. Um, one, one question that I, I have for you is um, also on, on the topic of mutuals. And historically, there's been a number of them that have converted from a mutual structure to another structure. For example, Visa famously did this. They started out as a mutual um, with a number of member banks. And then eventually they, they converted to a traditional, you know, Delaware C Corp, I think, and, and went public um, to, the, to the wider public. And so I'm wondering if, um, if there are circumstances that you think might make sense um, for demutualization, demutualization of this membership model in the context of crypto. And, and specifically, do you think it's possible for a membership token to transmute to something um, like a commodity? Um, and and what, would, what would that entail? No question about it. You know, many mutual insurance companies and many mutual savings banks converted to stock corporations at a certain point in time. So the way I think about it is, you know, I mentioned the safe harbor concept earlier. This is like a synthetic version of a safe harbor. So let's say that today, let, let's say that you're a brand new startup, right? And your network's not functional and you're a central management team and et cetera. Today, you could potentially use the mutual structure to raise money and build your network today, as long as you have the secondary trading limitation built in. And then three or four years from now, when the network's fully functioning, you're throwing off cash and there's a big market that wants to invest in your enterprise, you could say, hey, we bought ourselves three or four years of runway with this initial offering. And we did that by limiting secondary trading. So we didn't violate the securities laws. Now, however, we have this giant IPO opportunity. We would like to go public. There is a process for demutualizing, as, as you say. And I won't get into the details today, except to say it's been done many, many times by lots of companies in different industries. So if you think about this as just a way of giving yourself a safe harbor, if you can have a great big coin offering but with this limitation, and you can live off of those dollars for long enough to get your project launched, then you could demutualize and do a compliant stock offering on the back end and be just fine. So until the Hester Purse, you know, safe harbor comes into play, this may be an attractive option to explore. Right. One, one thing I might add is, I think what the mutual model is also compatible with, with other types of fundraising. For example, you, I could imagine you, you raise, say, a seed round from, from traditional VC and, and your private company and you're building the product. Then once the product is built to some extent, um, you, you start to build a community around it. And, and then at that point, you start to, to employ the mutual model to invite that community to, to have some real skin in the game um, by owning a piece of the product or service through this membership model. And then finally, you know, once the community is active and participating in the network, you could imagine um, at that point turning control just over to the community outright, right? And, and at that point, perhaps maybe you're sufficiently decentralized so as not to be considered a, a, a security um, and lift some of the, the yeah, restrictions. That's a little bit the Ethereum model in, in a funny right. way, right? I mean, you had a central team who built it and everybody knew who they were and they did this thing and then their protocol became so popular that it became a platform owned by the community. I mean, I think that's absolutely a way that one can do this. Yeah, cool. So I think, yeah, important to note, this is brand new stuff. So again, just want to reiterate that, but really exciting. Um, so move, moving off the, the membership model that you proposed, the next question is from Francesco and Mark. And they ask from a tax and compliance perspective, how do you think about a decentralized network rewarding participants? So what, what about a business that pays the network to receive a service? How do I compensate project members or advisors in tokens while not causing adverse tax effects like phantom income? Yeah, that, that, so, so it's a great question. Um, uh, so, and I'm gonna, I haven't thought about this a ton before, so I'm gonna free associate a little bit. The first thing I would say is if it's truly a decentralized network and no one person owns it, so in other words, if people do not have an equity interest in the network, 
but instead the benefits of this are kind of put back into the network. I, I think what you would say is that there is no phantom income because I don't own a fractional share of the network. I, I just own tokens, let's say. So I, I would begin with that concept. I think that um, there are obviously are a lot of different ways of distributing value back to the network holders or back to the token holders. Um, you know, one is assuming that your network is live and the tokens are trading on a secondary you know, market, uh, the idea would be that the more valuable the network is, if if the value is being plowed back into iterating the network and doing version two, three, four, five of the network and those kinds of things, sort of by definition, the value of my tokens will go up because more people in the external world will want access to the network. So that's just regular equity type returns. Um, and having said that, if the way that you distribute that value is in the form of um, staking rewards or or you know sort of airdrops or dividends or something like that, you know, that's when you get into the tax issue I was describing earlier, which is it can be a good thing. It can raise the value of everybody's tokens. Um, but because there's no tax basis in that, it's hard to calculate taxes. That, that's always the issue, right? So, um, you know, if you think about it, if you have a savings account and you earn a certain rate of interest, we all understand that the, the, the uh, interest itself is ordinary income. If you have a stock and it grows in value and you save, we understand that the value of the stock increase is a capital gain. But if I've just been given something that I didn't earn and it isn't interest, it's just shown up in my account, that's where the tax authorities have a big gray area. And so I would tell you that's a place where you really will need to consult some good tax counsel. Um, uh, you know, you'll also want to consult with your exchange, talk about programs that they can help you with. We have a large tax department at Coinbase, as do other exchanges. But that's a complicated question that you'd really want to talk to your advisors about in a specific circumstance. Right, right, and and this is all still very emerging, and I I would say the IRS has been relatively slow to to comment on it, right? Right. Um, okay, cool. So the next one is from Guy, um, and yes, not not considering investments, how are existing projects held responsible for potential regulatory violations? For example, a privacy coin that makes anonymous payments possible without KYC AML, but never had a sale of tokens or, or took in, took investment. Right. Well, so so if you never had a sale of a token, and, and so you don't have a you don't, don't have a securities issue or anything like that, there's still the world of law enforcement, right? So the agency that is most responsible for privacy tokens or is focused the most on it is not the SEC. It's the Department of Homeland Security, right? And so the the concern would be if you are facilitating a criminal enterprise, it doesn't have to be a financial problem. That's just a crime. Right. And so DHS, the Department of Justice, investigate those kinds of things. There hasn't yet been a significant prosecution of a privacy token as such. But we know that in late 2018 and early 2019, the Department of Homeland Security did announce a wide uh, sort of a wide ranging investigation of privacy token projects generally. And as I say, the, the things that I would be concerned about would be just general criminal prosecution of obstruction of justice laws, of um, you know, money laundering laws, not in that you are doing the money laundering because you're not selling the token, but you've built a technology that facilitates that, which sounds like an aiding and abetting violation. So don't don't think that just because you haven't sold a token, there's no law that applies to you. There are plenty of people who aren't selling things that nonetheless may be violating the law. Right. Okay. Last one is from James. And, and he asks whether you can touch on tokens that are made for the purpose of a video or social game. Um, and, and some of the FinCEN or SEC considerations for in-game in -game currencies that may not be crypto? Um, great question. Uh, what I would tell you is, and, and so I'm going to give you sort of an impressionistic answer. When I talk to the SEC about various token projects and try to help them understand what the point of crypto is in the first place, one of the examples that they find most readily understandable actually are in-game tokens. <clears throat> you know, we, we have a number of, of partners in the, in the, the Bay Area who are, you know, who have been consulting us for quite a while about tokens that they're using in gaming. I have not yet heard anybody give a securities-related or a commodities-related um, legal problem with that. And indeed, they understand the utility of that better than almost any other scenario because they all have kids who are trying to get to the, you know, the next level in Fortnite or they want to make sure that there's no latency in their gaming uh, as, as their credit card is pinged for additional lives or additional features. So what I would tell you is, if, if anything, the gaming scenario probably is a little bit less risky from, from that regulatory perspective than some other kinds of tokens. I, I would be fairly bullish on that. Cool. Okay, great. 
Well, with that, I think we'll, we'll let you go enjoy the rest of your Friday evening. And Brian, thank you so much for an amazing presentation that was so comprehensive. So everyone, please give a, a virtual round of applause, Brian. Thanks for joining us. Much good luck. Thank you. 